Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we've got another firearms fact episode for you and we're going to be diving into the series of diminishing returns in relation to the firearms world. Uh, not only fiscal uh, but the physical properties of certain guns and uh, if you'll bear with us I think you'll come away uh, understanding where we're coming from on this. Uh, I think we've got some great info to put out. And I would like to thank our friends at Sonoran Desert Institute for supporting Firearms Facts. Great group of people. Uh, if you want to learn more about gunsmithing, they have some great online programs in the realm of higher learning in that regard. Check them out. Really good folks. Uh, if you got that unused GI bill, folks, use it. They accept GI. So uh, definitely big thanks to SDI for supporting Firearms Facts. All right, so when we say series of diminishing returns, what in the heck does this even mean, right? So this can apply to a lot of different areas in the consumer world, uh, not just firearms. Now, we are going to focus on firearms, but we will use some other examples uh, in other areas as well, um, just so you can get an idea to maybe relate to it a little bit more if you're not quite grasping what we're getting at mm -hmm. here. But when we talk about diminishing returns in the firearms world, uh, there's a few basic um, ideas that we could fall into here, mm -hmm. right? Yep. One would be uh, financial uh, series of diminishing returns or just the properties of the guns themselves. So where do you think we should start? Well, let's see. Well, when you're talking about diminishing returns in like an economic sense, it means like, all right, if you're a manufacturer and you're producing a product, well, if you start producing more of those products, but then you don't put anything else into uh, like the, the raw materials and such, you're just kind of using what you have. Well, you're going to have to slow down production because you're going to run out of stuff, right? Um, for the most part. But with, with firearms, what we were thinking about was, okay, financially, like, all right, you buy this crazy Uber gun, all right? But it's like a, a new car. It loses so much of its value, right, when you, like, take it off a lot, mm -hmm. all right? So used guns in that sense could be a little bit better investment if you don't want to have such a, a, a you know a diminished return if you ever tried to sell that gun um, mm -hmm. in performance all right it's like you get to a certain point in performance where like do you really need that extra like magnum performance for shooting a deer at 70 yards you know in in Georgia or Ohio or wherever you know uh, or is it just like I want it because I want it like me now let me be clear <laughs> Allow me to be clear. <laughs> Allow me to clarify for Chad. Okay. There is nothing wrong with wanting cool stuff. Okay. No. And we're certainly not saying don't strive for that <clears throat> Barrett M107 or that H&K, you know, 716 or, or, you know, your favorite SIG rifle. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that expensive things aren't good. Well, look, let's, let's make okay. it clear. Guns are never a bad investment. They are not. Uh, but I think what we do get into when we talk about this diminishing return uh, would be that there's also a performance diminishing return where, okay, you, you know, you can buy an off-the-shelf uh, Remington 700 that might shoot exceptionally good stock, mm. right? And then you've got the folks that will spend an additional, you know, several thousand dollars equating to uh, more than the gun may even be worth from the beginning, uh, worth of accessories uh, into the product to, uh, and, and maybe the, the performance improvement of the product is perceived, and, and maybe not actual, or maybe the performance and enhancement you get out of the upgrades uh, are actually really good. Uh, you know, we could look at uh, a few examples here. So I do have some examples on the table, and these just happen to be ones that jumped out at me. So, all right, we could, we could just dive into that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that statement here on this first gun on the end here. So this started out as a Ruger Charger pistol. Like $300 pistol? You know? Well, they're not now. But yeah. It used in, to be. In a normal environment would be a $300 pistol. And uh, we opted for the uh, Enoch Industries uh, chassis, okay? And this particular one, that's their Deep Six mm -hmm. chassis. So we the only thing stock on this gun is the uh, receiver. <laughs> we opted for a Volkortsen trigger pack, a uh, Volkortsen bolt, uh, their six inch Volkortsen carbon fiber wrap barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a suppressor on here. We've got a weapons light. Uh, uh. Uh, we've got a folding brace. Uh, we've upgraded the grip module. Uh, you know, we've got a really nice optic on here, MRS from Steiner, nice mm -hmm. and small. Um, now, we did do a complete video on this gun, if this is something you want to check out. Uh, we have a full video on it, so I'm not going to go into every tiny little detail. Well, and, its, uh, and its original configuration as well. Correct. So. Yeah, so the, in the original configuration and in uh, the configuration that you see it in here. Mm -hmm. Now, one could argue, okay, now it, does this represent some diminishing return? I think not. 
uh, because I think the uh, Deep six, 6 chassis uh, gets that length nice and short. Uh, you've got a suppressor, which makes it super quiet. The trigger is great, so of course your accuracy is going to be really good. So trigger upgrades are definitely cool. Um, I personally, okay, for my purposes and my needs, uh, I feel that, you know, what I've got in this gun and what it took to put it together, uh, I'm very happy with it. I'm pleased with it. Now, is that to say that the stock Ruger Charger pistol is not a great gun out of the box? It was great. Mm -hmm. It worked fine. Okay, sure, the trigger might be a little stiffer on the factory gun. Uh, the, the factory uh, stock or receiver or whatever you want to, well, I guess what I'm saying, the, the stock assembly um, might be, you know, it's polymer. It's just real basic, but it's also lightweight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, it might be real basic uh, out the gate as a, as a you know, out-of-the-box gun. Um, but this does represent some great upgrades that, that, yes, while expensive, it doesn't take away from what the gun was to begin with, which was a very useful gun right out of the box. So with, with 1022s and, and other 22s, really, but the 1022 especially because, you know, it is a very, very popular platform <sighs> for people. And it has more accessories out there available than you can count. Okay, like all the upgrades that Eric mentioned, there are several companies that offer different versions of each one of those items, and there's so much to choose from, it's just crazy. But all right, when, when you think about all right, if, if I'm on a budget, okay, and I buy the stock charger pistol, okay, well, of course, I'm gonna put a brace on it, okay, of course, if I've got a suppressor, I'm gonna drop a suppressor on it, of course, if I got a red dot, I'm gonna drop it on there. Well, what's the actual potential of that gun out the gate? I mean, is it uh, maybe like a four MOA gun? Okay, will it shoot a four-inch group at 100 yards? Because really with the chargers, you know, the barrels are a little bit long, but, you know, they're, they're stock barrels. So maybe you could expect two MOA, okay? Eric put a shorter barrel on this, but a much higher quality barrel. So we haven't really tested this for accuracy or anything at longer range, but is it still holding that two MOA? Or is it maybe a little bit better? This is a match-grade barrel, although a little bit shorter. Yep. it might be holding a little bit better accuracy. The trigger certainly gives you a lot more accuracy and precision potential. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the bolt itself, it's a precision you know, machine bolt, okay, and it's got what's called like a, a blueprinting done to it. So the bolt face itself is perfectly square to the uh, the uh, barrel face, you know, the chamber face. So those two mating surfaces contact 100%. Some of the factory offerings, you might have, you know, a little bit of, you know, um, you might have a little machining error on the front face of the bolt and the the round might not sit perfectly square in the bolt face and might not go into the chamber perfectly square so it's mm -hmm. off kilter a little bit so each time that firing pin hits it, it changes just slightly you know and it could throw your accuracy off um so really you got to think about it all right all those upgrades are they worth that extra expense to get that return that you wanted, which is, you know, the accuracy or the precision or, you know, just maybe the feel or the accessorization of accessorization, is that a word? You know, the ability to add more accessories to the front of it. Cause we know sometimes like some of the stock Rugers, they, they lack in, in the department of being able to add, uh, you know, items like a flashlight or a, um, you know, a laser device or anything like mm -hmm. that to the front end of the guns. So eh, just so many things to think about. So the financial return, let's just say what you spend versus what you get, of course that's up to every person. And like I mentioned earlier, hey, you want all the crazy gadgets? Go for it. We're not saying don't do it. Now let's let's get on to a, um, let's just say a, this would be a diminishing return that involves, uh, and this is actually one of the things that uh, prompted uh, us making this video is I, I kind of made this observation, okay? Uh, so this is a 9.3 by 62 uh, Ruger M77. And you can see that it's in a uh, Zytel uh, M77 Mark II all-weather boat paddle stock. Uh, this is not the normal stock that comes on this gun. Mm -hmm. The Hawkeyes were never produced. It's a Hawkeye action, but it fits a Mark II stock. And these were never available in this stock. So this is sort of a little bit of a hodgepodge mm -hmm. I put together. And I love this rifle. It is very lightweight. Okay, now... The reason that I mentioned that is some form of a diminishing return is because, all right, you look at some of these hunting rifles that are out there, and I'll just kind of briefly mention this. Mm. This stock came off of a Magnum length action Ruger M77 all weather and 300 Winchester Magnum. And it kicked so hard. I mean, look, I'm not a wimp when it comes to recoil, okay? But it had so much recoil, it, it was just unbearable. 
it was so much recoil. So I changed that action out and put it in a Boyd's uh, like pepper laminate stock with like a really gnarly recoil pad on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that helped a lot, right? So, all right, diminishing return. So mm -hmm. there's an example. While we can go lightweight on the stock, on the action, uh, we can have a lightweight scope, you know, we can do what we can to cut weight off of a hunting rifle. There will be some form of diminishing returns in that you're gonna have to expect that cartridge for cartridge, the lighter you make the rifle, the more recoil you're going to feel. All right. So there is no such thing as a free lunch in physics. All right. So law of diminishing returns also deals in the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So I expected this gun to be highly unpleasant to shoot, but it really wasn't that bad. It's like shooting a 30 alt six in terms of the recoil. It might have a little bit more recoil. Uh, I am going to go over the nine threes in a future video. Stay tuned for that. Uh, but for now, I just want to mention that this is not the original stock on this gun. Now, I feel like, hey, you know, shedding that little bit of extra weight over the wood stock, is that a diminishing return? Well, mm -hmm. well no. Uh, it comes down to, okay, how much are you going to shoot the gun in a hunting situation versus how long you're going to carry the gun? Yep. You may carry the gun two miles up a mountain to go hunt, you know, <laughs> ram the sheep or whatever, you know? Or you may be going on a, a two-mile-long moose hunt or elk hunt where you've got to trek in a long way and, and carry this thing a long way. So what becomes a diminishing return? The the excitement you're feeling when you're about to pull the trigger on an elk. And yeah, the gun might kick a heck of a lot harder than normal, mm. but is that one shot going to bother you versus having you know maybe a half a pound or a pound lighter, a, a, less, a pound less that you've got to carry around with you? Mm. So look... I was I was curious about the recoil energy. So like on Chuck Hawks, the 9.3 by 62 in a similarly similarly or weighted rifle has 28 foot pounds of recoil energy, 300 wind mag. Uh, the heaviest pill, yeah, and about the same weight has 24. So this has more. It's got more recoil energy. It just doesn't feel like it. I know, but it's, may, it's maybe weird. I've just matured as a shooter and I can handle recoil better, but I just recall this gun in 300 Win Mag being just a vicious, vicious to shoot. But I'm glad I ended up having the stock uh, laying around mm -hmm. off the 300 Win Mag, and my wife bought me this rifle for Christmas. I've always wanted a 9.3 by 62. I saw it, we got it, and now, I could not be happy. Now, if we're talking about like 458 Win Mag. Yeah. That's another story. That's certainly or like, another story. What, what was that one that Ray had? 600, uh, not 600 nitro. It was something wild. Uh, I think it was like 600 overkill. Over, or yeah, 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 600 overkill. Yeah, see, a custom <laughs> CZ. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you want to talk about the law of diminishing returns? Like, well, I'm going to get my deer rifle out. I'm going to go grab my 600 overkill. <laughs> you, you, could to <laughs> you could totally make that distinction. You could totally make that distinction. All right, okay, a guy that takes a, you know, 7 millimeter Magnum uh, with a with a, with a 12 power scope. Oh, no, no, to, no think, to, think bigger. Like a thirty power scope, <laughs> right? You know, you got a you got a telescope on on top of your dang rifle, and you're shooting a seven millimeter Magnum with the big old crazy whatever hot rod load forty yards to kill a deer forty yards away. So I mean, hey, if that's what you want to do, now I will say a seven millimeter Magnum is a great deer cartridge, but it's like selecting the right tool for the right job. I mean, hey, it, 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 is is that an issue for whoever Man. wants to do that? Hey, as long as you can fulfill the task. Hey you man, do, you do you. Hey, look, man, that seven mil, forty yards ain't enough for it to get up to speed, man. I mean, come on, you want to talk about dimension returns? You're not even letting it fly enough to get up to speed. Look, I mean, you, <laughs> when you're deer hunting, you could take some short shots. You can, or you could take some long shots. So, bringing a tool that is going to be the correct tool for mm. the job is the most important aspect yep. of it. So, getting away from that. Mm. All right, now I'll just quickly mention, and and I don't. I didn't mean for all these to be Rugers, but it just happened to be. Real quick, hang on, before you go, look. Yeah. Now, if you have a rifle that is set up for the maximum range that you would potentially take an animal at, and where you hunt, you might be going through some thick brush, whatever the case is, but you might be going out in an open, open field or whatever with a 600-yard shot, mm -hmm. then it is warranted to have uh, whatever cartridge, whatever rifle, okay, is chambered in, set up for that capability, for those two extremes, okay? 
a three to nine power optic, a four to 12 power optic, whatever mm -hmm. the case is, okay? Close range, drop it down to low power. Further range, take it up to 10 power, whatever the case is. Having the option there, but if you only hunt like on a 40 yard food plot, having a 300 wind mag or something is really just a little bit overkill. I mean, again yeah, though, but, again, but. What, what, what I will mention, do you. If that makes you happy and that's what you want to do, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not. I, I don't want to chastise anybody. Look, you you do you. Nah, we're just poking a little bit of fun. If here, that's what so. you want, you do it. All, All right, right. Now, ahead, uh, another example that I want to bring up. All right, diminishing returns, and and this is not necessarily a bad thing. This is just a difference in the economy of of what we look at here, right? So now, granted, these are two different. That this is a 22, and I don't have a Ruger American in 22. Chad does. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one is in 450 Bushmaster. Same action, pretty much, but, and everything. But so. like back in the 90s, right, you know, Ruger put out these boat paddle, you know, bolt action M77 22s. And of course, their M77 series, like you see here, this 9.3 here. Um, I love these rifles, but they do represent a considerable cost. Mm -hmm. So it's like if we compare something like a good old, you know, M77 22 bolt gun versus a Ruger American that costs $200. I mean, well, they used to. Well, yeah. 250 bucks yeah. for a good quality 22 you're talking half the price for a good quality gun mm -hmm. so when you look at this diminishing return uh phenomenon that we're looking at here um you look at the savage axis mm -hmm. that's an entry level gun you look at the ruger american that's sort of their entry level gun back in the 90s there was no such thing as like a, a cheaper alternative to uh, whatever gun you may see, right? So it's like if you wanted an M77-22, you wanted a bolt-action 22 that took Ruger 1022 magazines from Ruger, you had to buy the M77-22, and they're, you know, 700, 800 bucks. They're not mm -hmm. cheap. So when you look at, okay, making a more affordable option, all right, I think these 450 Bushmasters are like... Just over 300 bucks. They're like 300 talking. bucks. Yeah. So that is considerably less. If you bought an M77 or Hawkeye, M77 Hawkeye or Mark II, whatever, you're talking, I mean, the prices on these guns are over $1,000 now. So you could buy three of these for what one of these costs. Now, remember, you've still got to put optic on it. You've still got to get rings, slings, accessories, whatnot. So let's take this $1,500 9.3 right here. Well, a great rifle, an awesome rifle. And let's compare it to this $300 450 Bushmaster. So, yes, you can obviously see that they employ some cost-cutting measures. You know, cheaper uh, stock, you know, much simpler action. It's not the same gun. It's a different gun, right? But with the amount of money that you saved on this, you got enough money to get yourself an optic. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if, you're, if you're thrifty for what you spent on this, you could have a tax stamp and a suppressor. And now you got a suppressed 450. Mm -hmm. Bushmaster. And something else to consider too. That's ready to take hunting for what this gun would cost out the box with nothing on it. Yep. Something else to consider too is the the intended use of the given item, okay, in question. So if you're just intended on having a, a hunting rifle that you're gonna take a maximum shot of say say 150 yards is like the longest shot that you would likely ever take, and that's a very rare instance. All right, and you just want a gun that you don't mind banging up and stuff like that. You know, it's just gonna be kind of a beater gun. Or you just spray paint rifle. it or whatever. So something like this is perfect for that circumstance. Okay, whereas all right, well I'm not gonna spend a two thousand or two thousand dollars on a on a rifle to go hunting with, you know, and and only go and hunt in my backyard at 100 yards on a food plot or whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's really up to the individual as far as like what they feel like the return is going to be for them. Okay, so you buy a simple gun like this, you go out, you beat it up a little bit, eh, no big deal, right? Because it's a tool, it's not like a collectible piece. The older M7722s, on the other hand, are quite collectible. These are very sought after guns. I mean, they command the same price as what the new rifles cost today, if not surpassing it in a lot of cases, depending on the model, especially like the boat paddle stocks. They're a pretty rare stock these days. Um, but you have to think about like collectability. Okay, am I buying my guns as an investment? Uh, you know, what am I expecting maybe down the line to do with these particular firearms? Am, am I gonna transfer them to my kids at some point, whatever, like will them to my kids? Uh, Am I going to gift them to my kids? Uh, so, if it's if it's a gifting thing, like later on in life, you got to think, okay, well, I'm not going to give my kid like a beat up gun, or maybe you will. I mean, 
And that comes down to your own, you know, personal requirements and, and what you want to do. And again, there's no wrong answer, mm. right? If 300 bucks is all you've got to spend on a bolt gun and you need to get out in the deer woods to go do some hunting, uh, the Americans will serve you quite well. Uh, the Ruger American, the Savage Axis, I mean, the Remington 770s. I mean, all of the major firearms companies now have an entry level version of their bolt guns. And in some cases, like I know Savage makes uh, some nice entry level, like 22s and things. Mm. So there's plenty of ways to get into being a gun owner with having a low barrier of entry. And in some cases, that diminishing return sort of just isn't even a thing anymore because the barrier of entry is so low and, and respectable and easy that the risk is low because if you're unhappy, well, at least you don't have a lot of money in it. Or if you damage it or something like that, drop it out of a deer stand. It's no uh, you're not out of you know a couple thousand bucks of, uh, worth of hunting rifle. Or maybe you're not into hunting and you don't know if you're going to like hunting. This is a great way to have a lower barrier of entry to be able to go out and try your hand at hunting. And then if you don't like it, well, you can go trade it back in or go sell or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to get away from rifles. I, I wanted to sort of make that distinction. I think mm -hmm. that makes that pretty clear. Hopefully it makes sense. Uh, another technological uh, diminishing return or potential uh, diminishing return that you could look at. All right, scandium. Recoil. Recoil. <laughs> okay. Well, so just right. like we mentioned with the 9.3, 300 Win Mag thing and changing out stocks and decreasing the weight of the gun... Uh, you are going to have more felt recoil no matter what gun it is. Shotguns, rifles, handguns, all right? So this is a uh, SW uh, 1911. So this is a Scandium frame 1911 from Smith & Wesson. And I love this gun. I, like I mean, as, as 1911s go, this is a sweet pistol, mm -hmm. and it's got the, you know, like the bobtail um, frame on it, which is just a great, comfortable 1911. I really love it. Night sights. I mean, I... I love the uh, the serrations on the slides. Kind of look like, you know, dragon scales. It's just mm. such a cool gun. They look like red drum scales. They do. Mm. They do. It's like a redfish. <laughs> you know. Oh. Well, anyway. But <laughs> all right. So I want to just share a story, and this may benefit some of you. Scandium is also used mm. in a variety of other pistols that Smith and Wesson makes as well. And I want to uh, refer back to a shot show uh, booth thing. You know, I went by the Smith and Wesson booth to. Uh, just go check out some of the mm. new guns. And one of the engineers from Smith & Wesson was standing around. And I asked him, I said, hey, uh, you know, that 329 PD that you guys make, it's a Scandium frame, 44 Magnum, <laughs> and it is light as a feather. It is very light. And I asked him, I said, hey, uh, so what kind of loads can that thing handle? Can, can you can you really, like, load that thing up to the full potential of a 44 Mag and squeeze the trigger and it not damage the gun? And his exact words were, the gun will handle whatever you can. So, all right, that is an immediate series of potential uh, diminishing returns you have to assess, okay, is while the gun is extremely light, uh, it also has brutalizing recoil. It does. It kicks so hard. It's the most unpleasant gun to shoot I've ever shot. Let's just say it upset my carpal tunnel. Dude. Like, one shot. But you also have to understand, I don't shoot w uh, wimp loads. No. When I shoot a 44 mag, I'm running three 310 grain mm. hard cast under wood, or I'm running a, a big solid 240 grain bullet, something with some substantial energy. Now, the 329 PD with the 44 special loads, not so bad. No. But, all right, you can't cheat physics. Okay, now while the recoil of the 44 special is lighter, what are we also not realizing? The full power of the mm -hmm. pistol. So now it's not a 44 Magnum anymore. It's, it's a 44, 44 special. special because the gun kicks so brutally hard that it almost makes the lightweight a moot point. At that point, you might as well just be carrying a 1911. Well, you know, well no. At that right. point, you might as well just carry a normal 44 Magnum that you can actually shoot accurately. So mm. the question is, now while I won't say that there aren't people out there that can't shoot the 329 PD extremely accurately, hey, mm. if you can, more power to you. But if it's a gun that's so lightweight, yeah, it's easy to carry, and it's, oh, man, I love this. But then when you shoot it, you can't shoot it accurately yeah. because it's so light. So that's an example of that. Yeah. Like this 1911, it's nice and lightweight, but it's a perfect balance. And the 45 ACP generally just doesn't kick that hard anyway. So this is an example of Scandium being employed in a way that I feel is on point. It's more useful, for sure. Extremely useful. So... You yes. think about that Scandium frame revolver, right? That 329. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so you have two schools of thought on that. I love this gun. Oh, God, it is so light. Isn't um, it? Scandium is lighter than titanium, but not quite as strong or durable. But it is a lighter weight metal than titanium is. Um, you think about the 329. All right, it's so lightweight to carry. I mean, you'd be comfortable carrying that thing all day long because you carry a full-size, like, 44 revolver. You're talking about an all-steel revolver that's 50 ounces or, or more, okay, loaded. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of weight to be carrying around on a regular basis. Um, and, and too, just the size is prohibitive and, and things like that. But when you have to draw it and you have to use it in a defensive situation, that, that weight will help that recoil, and you can run those heavier loads, and you can probably shoot it more accurately. The Scandium frame model, though, easy to carry, but much harder to master. So mm -hmm. the diminishing return on that front could be, okay, you have to expend so much more cost in, in training and ammunition, things like that, to get to the point that you could be at with a standard gun. So is it really worth that extra cost and, and that lighter weight to carry, or do you just get used to carrying the heavier gun? Also, to so, be fair, the 329 is a, is a significantly more expensive revolver than an all-steel version would be. Okay. Uh, I would like to add also, so one of the guns that I carry as a backup gun, uh, when I'm out deer hunting, I carry a 629. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, and it's, a, I think, a 4-inch 44 mm -hmm. Magnum. And I carry uh, the Hornady uh, 240 grain XTP rounds in it, you know. So not on the top end of a crazy load, but definitely not a light load either. You know, I carry full bore ammunition. And the other day I was out uh, deer hunting one morning, and I had an opportunity to shoot a doe. And uh, I, in the stand that I was in, I had my rifle with me, but it was kind of difficult to maneuver. Um, so I decided, you know, she was passing through and I had a quick moment. I was like, you know what? You know, I, I have my um, Diamond D uh, custom chest rig that Chad got me for Christmas last year. Thanks, Chad. You're welcome. And um, the same one Hickok made, kind of famous. But anyway. Yeah, I bought one for everybody. Sorry, shameless plug for Hickok <laughs> there. But, but anyway, I, I, uh, I pulled that revolver out and I... I sat it in front of me and I cocked the hammer real slow, made sure it was quiet. And when I'm when I'm cocking the hammer, I'll I'll rotate the cylinder mm -hmm. with my fingers so I can feel it, and that way it, it's silent, it makes no noise. Okay, mm -hmm. and I sat it on the the lip of the stand. I had a wood box around me, and I waited for her to walk out. And I I'll, and she walked out, <laughs> poo, right in the neck, <laughs> instant incapacitation. So mm -hmm. revolvers for hunting use are they certainly have their their um their uses, mm -hmm. but the point I'm making is had I been carrying the 329 sure it would have been lighter to carry but i seriously doubt i could have accurately fired the revolver with one hand much less hit the deer in the neck at 40 yards mm. so a gun that is useful is a gun that you can shoot accurately regardless of the weight the old saying pack light freeze at night mm -hmm. comes into play sure you can pack a light rucksack but you may not pack everything you need and that's what that saying means, right? So if you get where you're going, you don't have the materials necessary to survive in combat or to bivouac or whatever you're going to do. Well, then what's the point? Why even, why carry that, gear at all that if, is, you're, <laughs> if you're not going to carry what you need? <laughs> that is one hell of a diminishing return, freezing to death. <laughs> uh, thank you. We'll be seeing you. Yep. I, I spent many, many times carrying 50-pound green tick on my back. Like, man, why are you carrying all that crap? It's like, you'll see you later. <laughs> exactly. So, so hey, man. Hey, man. Anyway. <laughs> all right. So, one last thing. I thought that I would show off uh, my 9L. Um, so, this one's got a slide rider on it, um, SRO from Trijicon. And this is, uh, I, I love this gun, right? And um, the guy that turned me on to this pistol was Jerry Mitchell. -like. And, um, you know, shooting his MMP, I, I just, I loved it, right? And when I had a chance to get into a 9L, and I've never really been a humongous fan of slide riding optics, but this one, man, with the ported barrel, it's got a five and a half inch ported barrel. Um, it's extremely accurate. The shot recovery is just stone cold awesome, right? It's just great. And as like a competition gun, or even just as a, a great carry gun, if you don't mind having the, you know, extra length, on the barrel and you know the extra space of the optic being taken up um, this is an exceptional handgun mm -hmm. so this in my opinion is almost like an overlooked option like i feel like people overlook the mmps a bit mm -hmm. and when you say series of diminishing returns all right so one could argue what if you're not willing to put in the time to learn how to shoot like maybe your sig 365 really well with like a little tiny romeo optic on it I'm not saying that optic isn't awesome, and I'm not even saying that this is a preferred optic over any other type of pistol riding uh, optic, slide rider, but 
choosing the appropriate tool for the appropriate job and making sure you've got enough time behind the gun to effectively use it is, can turn it into a diminishing return. Mm -hmm. uh, and the instant that I put this dot on here, the instant I took it out and shot it, I was like, yeah, this sucker's money. And this is a great, great handgun. The One old, of my favorites. The older uh, L that you have is a nice gun too, but man, the, the ports, I mean, make that thing purr like a kitten. Actually, you're right. You know? Yeah, so this That's is a 9L, mm -hmm. the Performance Center. The old one that I've got is is the old Pro, Pro Series, series. Mm -hmm. which is kind of a different animal. That's before, I guess, they were doing Performance Center. Yeah, but um, two, like competition guns. Okay, so on competition guns, a lot of guys will add weight to them. You know, they have tungsten uh, recoil rods. Uh, Jerry runs lights on most of his guns to add that extra weight up front to help keep the muzzle flip down. Um, so, in that sense, you know, you're kind of you're you're investing more in an increased return on the performance of the gun. You know, so it's just <laughs> we talk about these subjects, and then like as we're filming. We always kind of think about yeah. new ideas. I'm like, I didn't think about that before we started. But really, I mean, uh, you could look at it so many different ways. There, there are. I mean, so the reason that I wanted to just add some of these things and to get to the juices flowing in your brains mm -hmm. is so that you kind of get an idea of, to keep that in the back of your mind, right? Um, there, there's a cost uh, to value paradigm. Um, if you haven't seen it, or listened to it rather, I should say, uh, Matt and I did a Life, Liberty, and Pursuit uh, podcast episode on um, the value of items, like where we assess value. What does value mm -hmm. really mean? Why are things expensive, right? So mm -hmm. when you get into the whole minutia of, all right, are you really getting what you pay for, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between the perception of, oh, well, I'm okay that I paid a lot of money for this because I really, really wanted it. Mm -hmm. And as long as you really wanted it and you're happy, then that's all that matters. That's all the justification needs to be versus okay, there's a task that I need to fulfill or there's a need I need to fulfill and money, while it is an option, uh, all I'm looking at is the initial barrier of entry to achieve the goal that I need to achieve. And then there's also, okay, well, do I upgrade this basic gun or do I buy one tricked out already? So there's all these different things to consider and I just want uh, those listening to maybe just uh, keep that in food for thought. You know, you can buy something tricked out from the factory or you can take a little time and upgrade as you go. I mean, sometimes there's a nice flexibility in taking like this charger that starts out basic and you know, one month you buy a bolt, next mm -hmm. month you buy a barrel and next month you buy a trigger and then an optic, then a light. And then before you know it, you've, you've pieced together something really cool mm -hmm. and you can kind of attack it as you go. Yep, I mean, I've pieced together guns like that before. Um, we also did a video about the hidden costs of gun ownership that's sort of in the same vein uh, of this video and also the, the podcast that Eric and Matt did. Um, but, so, we talked about uh, diminishing returns on performance and such, mm -hmm. right? Okay, or potential returns on performance. We talked weight about... Weight versus recoil. Yeah, weight versus recoil. And then we talked about, like, handguns and recoil and shootability. Yeah, materials. So, materials and different materials yeah. come into play. So, um, keep that in mind. There's no such thing as a free lunch in physics, <laughs> boys and girls, and that's what we want to get out here. Do we have that on a shirt yet? We need to. I, I, may, I may have to do that. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for watching today's Firearms Fact. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this should give you food for thought to keep some things in the back of your mind when it comes to procuring your newest addition to your collection or maybe upgrading one. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Uh, definitely want to take a moment to thank all of our Patreon supporters, those of you who purchase man cans, uh, those of you who go over on Ballistic Inc., pick yourself up a snazzy t-shirt. If you love the channel and you wish to support us directly, those are some of the ways you can do so. Uh, thank you so much. Many more videos on the way. We'll see you next time. Take care, guys.